How's it going, everyone? This is John Payne with Cashflow Veteran Podcast. I'm really excited to have uh, my guest back on today. He is the first repeat guest, and it, it uh, still will be the first of many. So, Andrew Hofrichter, thanks so much for coming back on. How's it been going? It has been going great. How are you? Doing well. So, we just were catching up real quick. You've recently uh, moved into a, a new place, but uh, what's been going on on the business front? You've mentioned that you've been having some good conversations and stuff as you've been moving forward with your business. So, what's going on in that regard? Oh, you know, just people learning about it, gaining interest. Um, I've seen some light bulb moments recently, which has been really cool. Um, just <laughs> tripping the light, fantastic, as uh, Jason Stapleton would always say. So, uh, you know, just mostly uh, people kind of coming to that first moment of realization where they're first seeing the, the true potential of this method and, and wanting to get involved, but still thinking that it's something they should do after something else. Right. Uh, so that's the next hurdle. Yeah, well, okay. So this method that we're talking about for people that don't know is the infinite banking concept. So if you don't mind, so I honestly encourage anybody who hasn't listened to our, listened or watched our episode from the first one to go to that one and really kind of get some of the basics. But just real quickly in, uh, just very succinctly, how what what is the infinite banking concept in IBC for maybe the first time person that might be hearing about it? Uh, the infinite banking concept is all about bringing the banking function down to the you and me level. So it's uh, all the things that a bank regularly does, which is storing money, uh, distributing money to those who you transact with and uh, loans and things like that. The goal is to, be able to get you to be able to do that for yourself um, and thus benefit from the flow of that money and benefit from the interest and all that stuff. Right. And, and specifically, we're using a particular vehicle um, in order to, to gain that. It's not like someone has to go out there and get a bank charter and to save up a whole bunch of money or, or do anything. Obviously, you got to fund it in some way. You do have to have some savings in order to have some investing, um, but you're using uh, vehicles uh, or specifically one vehicle optimized in a way that allows you to recapture a lot of the interest that you might be giving to a big bank that's out there. And putting that money to work for you, because guess what? You can make a lot of money just like the banks do by uh, lending that out, whether that's to yourself or recapturing it in some way, rather than going out and financing the rest of your life somewhere else, which is one of the awesome parts about that. And the vehicle that we're talking about is whole life insurance policy. And that comes with a lot of connotations that a lot of people have over the years uh, of, of a lot of marketing and a lot of, um, you know, different financial advice that people people have. Um, and I want to caveat our conversation today that while it's it's good to go back and listen to our first conversation, because it goes over the overall concept itself, because it is a cash flow management system, it is a cash flow management management mindset um, of what we're talking about. And so anybody that's listening in on this, they, they might get maybe the wrong impression when they listen to this one, because we're going to be talking about it from an investment perspective, which it can be used for an investment, but it's not strictly or primarily an investment vehicle, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but that's uh, good. Oh, I was just going to say that's that's not when you're talking about the infinite banking concept specifically. We're not talking about whole life insurance as an investment at all. Uh, it's right. just the vehicle by which we bank, and right. banking is a process. Exactly. So uh, one of the things in this concept comes from. Nelson Nash and the Nelson Nash Institute and him really putting it together. And the two people that have really kind of expounded upon that has been Carlos Lara and Bob Murphy. And there was one thing out of all the books that I've read and all the articles I've read from these two guys and even reading Nelson Nash that um, when it comes to meeting people where they're at, they're most of the time concerned with getting out of debt, getting their financial house kind of in order. And that's certainly a way to go about it. But Carlos Lara, having his uh, business restructuring background, always says that the, some of the biggest light bulbs that he sees has been from business owners and the impact that something can have that for uh, business ownership, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, but everyone's question when it comes to it, because they have all these other vehicles that you could be putting money into and having your money working for you, is you know they compare it to what they already know and he even broke it down and goes, even if you're considering an investment, what would you consider the perfect investment? Rather than me trying to argue or try to convince you specifically of why this is a great thing to do, what is that person's conception? So let's go ahead and define kind of what a perfect investment might be. What is the ideal investment? And that's actually what 
this entire month of my podcast has been dedicated to because we've talked about uh, Roth IRAs. We talked about 401ks. I talked about it from a military perspective and from a civilian perspective as well. And just asking that question, what is an ideal investment? And it was definitely inspired mainly by Carlos Lara using this concept and going, fine, you know what, if you, if you want to talk about investing, then let's talk about it. What is the perfect investment? So that's kind of the conversation mm -hmm. I really want to get into about IBC. And so I, I'm glad we were able to caveat kind of what IBC is, what it is not, but then I do want to kind of hone in this um, concept a little bit further to talk about what the ideal or perfect investment is. And so I, I want you to gotta go ahead and expand, at least from your perspective, what it is, and we'll have some conversations uh, and some other questions that could probably come about from it. Yeah, well, this, uh, this concept of this, this question of the ideal investment, it came from a thought experiment, really. It basically, right. Laura explains in the book that uh, people would always ask him, what he put his money into. And so rather than just telling them up front, he would say, okay, well, let's do a thought experiment. Of, I want you to think about what your attributes of the ideal investment would be. And then, you know, create this big list and then tell them how it correlates to whole life insurance. Right. Um, so we're, it's kind of hard to do it in a situation like this where we both already know where we're going sure. and we can't have people try to brainstorm about all the things they would want, but we can kind of create our own list and just show how it works. Right. So uh, I, I can just kind of name off a lot of the things that they talked about because everyone's looking for about the same things at the beginning. Right. First yeah, of which sure. is high rate of return. Yep. Um, whenever you're talking about investments, everyone's trying to get the highest rate of return that they can because that's the, the typical traditional mindset. Right. So that's item number one is you want a high rate of return and you want that return to be consistent, uh, predictable. You, you know, you don't want it to be incredibly volatile. It's it, If you had two investments that both gave you the same overall return over time, you would rather pick the one that was slow and steady to that goal rather than jump it up and down all the time to get to the same place, right? That's right. Um, so kind of in line with those, you want something that's safe, that there's very little risk, if any at all, of losing the money. Um, you're looking for something that with all those qualities is very liquid so that if you want to access it or need to use it in some way, it's easy to convert it into cash that you can then use. And uh, feel free to interrupt me if there's anything you want to. Well, so yeah, you're, you're, you're talk. checking out the list and, I, and I'll, uh, I'll go on. So at, at infinitebanking.org slash the perfect dash, sorry, the per dash perfect dash investment. He kind of has this <laughs> list. So I'm glad you're, you're basically going right down the list. And I, I certainly appreciate that to keep us uh, moving through that. But what is what in your, when people are thinking about what a high rate of return might actually be, what what nominal value would you say would be a quote unquote high rate of return, or how would you assess that? Because someone might say that, thinking, "Oh, well, I, you know, I want, you know, ten percent sounds good, twelve percent sounds great, thirty percent. Oh, why can't I have thirty yeah. percent?" Right. Uh, I think high rate of return is completely relative, uh, and right. and I think these attributes are made somewhat general on purpose right um because we're not trying to talk about specific numbers or things right now we're trying to brainstorm the ideal investment so high rate of return for some people is 10 percent or 12 percent, but there's other people out there who wouldn't put money into something if they couldn't get 20 or 25 percent out of it so it's right. it's all relative to to what's possible for you what can you do with that money and how much can you expect to get out of it for someone who doesn't have a lot of skills or a, or a business that they can plow that money into to really magnify it, a 10% return could be amazing. Uh, but for someone who does do those things, who has a lot of skill in sales and marketing and brand building and all these kind of things, and they have a business that they can put money into, well, they might be expecting 100%, 150% returns on their money. Right. So it's all relative. Right. And that's what, you know, with the other conversations I've been having, it, you know, a lot of it's about getting your own you know, personal financial stuff in order, which also might mean that you just need to read some books. Maybe the first investment you should be making that's going to give you a thousand times return is reading a book. I mean, actually getting, you know, a $12, $20 book or a number of them, reading them and then applying it. I mean, there's no telling how big that investment, you know, how small the investment is, but how much return you're going to get on the education piece that's improving yourself. Uh, and I'm going to have some other guests that are going to come on to talk about that a little bit more here in the next couple uh, weeks as well. But um, what I find, and the reason why I wanted you to kind of specify that a little bit is that it is absolutely relative when it comes to what a, the definition of a high rate of return, because it also looks at the different vehicles you could be having. But one of the things that he brings up 
And the, and the books that we've been talking about have been everything from um, how privatized banking really works. And it also the case for IBC, the, the second edition mm-hmm. that they had as well that they came out with. Um, and then obviously Nelson Nash's text as well. Um, but he talked about in how privatized banking really works, the volume of interest versus the rate of interest and why understanding this concept is so important is, and because people might get so fixated on the numbers, I feel that that's a habit that people have, especially when they're, when we start talking about and arguing about, or you see posts online or Google reviews or whatever, you start getting into uh, the quagmire of the internet and having this conversation and you read what people are talking about. It seems interesting to me that while there are people who think very long term about numbers and are very disciplined about those numbers, I find that getting so specific sometimes um, on what a specific rate of return might be is really kind of satisfying this interest just to know. You, you want to know. You're, you're not trying to you know, go on Google just so that you can collapse the amount of time that you're having to, quote unquote, learn something. And so for that volume of interest versus rate of interest and how that applies is it really starts getting into the people's low time preference versus a high time preference, Mm. meaning that the volume of interest is a long term thought process, whereas the rate of interest is really a short short term. And the best way I can kind of describe that is when somebody's looking at it, like, look, the whole truth in lending statements on anything you get will tell you the amount of interest over time that you're going to have. And it's astounding when you're looking uh, at it. Wow. Especially just having bought a house. It's very fresh to me. And oh, it's painful. But most people, when they go to buy, they make their purchasing decision. And it's not necessarily wrong. But what I'm saying is that they are uh, removing the amount of overall interest in their lifetime for, hey, what can fit in my current monthly budget? Mm -hmm. And that's part of the mindset shift of IBC that comes along with that. So I know I've been throwing all these different terms and stuff out there. But that's kind of the big point that I'm trying to make. And when we're talking about a high rate of turn, it, you got to ask the question compared to what you have to slow down and think and go, okay, how much money am I paying in total? And you have to look at that. Well, that's money that I could be capturing back myself. And once you understand what vehicle makes the most sense to put into play for the long term, you then can start making those short term adjustments. But I feel like so many people start from that short term thinking, uh, and then putting it in a vehicle. And, and that's where the marketing basically has been of why somebody should buy one product over another product is that it's, it's marketing and conversations about around short-term solutions for what people have because they're, a lot of people are in financial pain in a lot of ways mm-hmm. and they're trying to figure it out. So Yeah. I, well, and uh, that, that ties in very closely to something that's talked about both in Becoming Your Own Banker, Nelson Nash, you know, the original book that yep. he wrote kind of expounding this idea and uh, the case for IBC, which we're kind of talking about more today. Both of them talked about the, the problem, right? The fact that the average American at least at the time of the writing, I think it's probably still true today, maybe even worse, worse. is sending 34 and a half cents of every dollar that they make to interest, right. which if you think about the interest rates, doesn't make any sense. But if you, if you look at that time factor, the amortized loans and the fact that, you know, in the early years of a house loan, 60, 70, 80% of that payment is going to interest. Yep. Well, all of a sudden it makes perfect sense how 34 and a half cents of every dollar is going to interest. So if, you know, you get into this conversation about rates of return. And yes, you can look at what's happening just with the policy internally with the rate of return. Or you could think about, well, what if you could use that to take over the banking function, which I know I'm getting ahead of myself here, yeah, sure. and recover that 34 and a half cents out of every dollar that you're losing to interest and have that going to you. Well, that's a huge rate of return right there if you can get that going. Right. So, And then and that's and that's what they're really getting at when they're talking about much more of a guaranteed and safe and a consistent rate of return on that money. So even though I'm like, wow, you're only talking like three or four or something percent, you got to remember banking institutions are some of the wealthiest, most powerful institutions in the world. And this is how they've been doing it for a long time, because they have a low time preference. They're really looking very, very far into the future. And guess what? So are whole life insurance policy companies. They are looking, they've, they predate the tax code, they predate um, the, the federal, uh, reserve bank that we have now. I mean, these, some of these institutions are 150 to 200 years old. Yeah. They're thinking long-term. Yeah. In fact, I would, I would argue that whole life insurance, uh, sorry, that life insurance companies are far more stable and, and more predictable than banks are. Um, and part of the reason that banks are so profitable is because they can create money out of thin air and charge interest on it. That's also true. (laughs) That helps a lot. 
Yeah. <laughs> and so and so we've talked about a consistent rate of return. You talked about the liquidity that's there. And I'm sure we'll get back into that. Talk about a guaranteed and safe uh, investment vehicle. And that's what people really want. And those are just some of the first few. And you talked about gaining a little bit of, you know, that interest back, that 30 to 40% of that interest on every dollar back from the bank when you're looking at the totality of what they might be uh, putting out there. But we're also talking about being able to capture something else, uh, or at least keep ourselves from doing that in the next step. And that's being tax free. Um, as far of what a good investment might be. And of course, you have 401ks, you have Roth IRAs, um, you have I, traditional IRAs, and that, and that correlates to a lot of other military products and that stuff too, where it's like, hey, this is a government incentive for you to do that because it's tax deferred or it's tax whatever. And we're talking about tax free. And I tend to think that if a government is telling you that you're getting some sort of benefit, it's not necessarily for your benefit, it's for the benefit of someone with you as kind of a secondary thought. Yeah. In, in general, I would say that's true. And, you know, technically it's, you're using post-tax dollars to start the policy, but sure. in, that, in that regard, it's kind of comparable to a Roth IRA in that you're also using post-tax dollars for that. And then the investment grows effectively tax-free as long as you don't do anything stupid with it. Right, exactly. hundred percent. So, um, And then what, what's next on the list for, uh, as, as kind of we're going through uh, the ideal well, some of these kind of seemed almost repetitive, but there's slight differences. So the next one sure. on the list is no market volatility, right? <laughs> uh, which I mean, go back to February, late February of this year. Uh, all the yeah. IBC practitioners out there were pretty happy with their status when the market dropped yep. 30%, 35. I don't even remember how much it was. And my money kept growing. It remained yeah. unchanged. Right. So, right. uh, they actually say in, in the case for IBC a little bit later, the point is to secede from the volatile right. system based on uh, Wall Street and the, the corrupt banking system. So no market volatility is huge. It's very predictable. Right. I mean, this whole my whole podcast, my whole brand of cash flow veteran is about how to secede from the system. That's the banking system, <clears throat> the military health system with the VA and you know, TRICARE. A lot of people just stay in for 20 years or so they don't have to pay for medical care. And it's like, you do understand that the likelihood of you being able to pay in cash for places that would take, you know, would structure their business a different way outside of what the insurance cartels have put out there. Uh, you would far benefit from being able to live a life that you would be very affordable in healthcare if you could actually open it up to the market. And honestly, there are some people that are currently doing that right now. And they're doing very well with a high quality of care without having to you know, navigate the uh, the big insurance companies that are out there that are that certainly are uh, making a very large and disparate impact upon you know people's bank accounts just by taking having to take out that much money just for healthcare. Yeah. All right. So uh, so no market volatility, which is super awesome. And yeah, we're going to be probably going into another recession uh, that wasn't caused by a you know sh a total shutdown, right? Um, so yeah. what's kind of next on the list for us? Uh, so it yield, uh, you know, this perfect investment that we're creating out of nothing, just brainstorming, right? In addition to all those previous things, it'd be awesome if it yielded an income or, or basically mm -hmm. was bringing in extra money aside from just appreciation. Right. So there's kind of every time you, t anytime you talk about investments, two things you're usually looking for aside from taxes and all that stuff, right? You're either looking for a cash flow from it. Right. which is kind of what we're talking about now, that yielding of income, or you're looking for appreciation to sell it at a future date, uh, which would be more like most of your stocks and things like that. Right. Some stocks, yeah. you know, they give dividends. And so that would also classify as this income side. <laughs> yeah, for sure. Um, so more specifically, as far as cash flow goes, can you, can you expound on that? Like, uh, you know, that'd be one of the, if I were a new person kind of looking at it, that'd be one of the natural questions asked is, what do you, what do you mean by cash flow? What cash flow would I possibly be getting from, uh, you know, this type of concept? Well, when I think about that, there's there's two components of it that come to mind, one of which is the dividends. So uh, if you're doing IBC with a policy that's with the right kind of company, because we don't use right. all companies, right? That's right. Uh, you want to have a dividend paying whole life policy, which is with a mutual company, right? So that makes you part owner of the company. So anytime the company has profits, they return those profits to the policy owners in the, in the form of dividends, which is just technically a return of premium. So in that regard, you're getting money out of this policy, if you will, right? Uh, in the form of a dividend, which you could take as income if you wanted to, or if you're doing IBC 
the way you should be doing it, you will then plow back into your policy and grow it even more. That's right. And the second component of that cash flow aspect is the fact that as the policy matures, you get to a, 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 an incredible cash flow point where the amount that your cash flow, or your cash value grows is greater than the amount you're paying in in premiums. So I may pay in a premium of $2,000 one year and the cash value grows by $2,500. Well, that extra $500 is accessible to me. It's usable to me. I can use it as part of my cash flow, just like the rest of the cash value, right? So right. it's kind of like I've been paid a little extra. But yeah. yeah, that's awesome. All right, so what's next on the list? Uh, creditor protected. And this mm. uh, is, is underrated by a lot of people. Uh, people don't think about it. I bet the, the rich do. People who have a lot of assets are interested in protecting those assets from right. legal problems or suits or whatever. So the reality is that almost universally, whole life insurance policies are completely protected from legal issues. Um, whether that be, you know, someone sues you because they fell in one of your rental properties or whatever. Yeah. It's not considered one of your takeable assets. It's a, it's a protection is what it is. That's what the asset is. So. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, yeah, that, I would say that that is very, very underrated when people are, are asking about what they can go after. Because part of the problem with the, the litigious society that we kind of live in is, I mean, let, let's say that there was um, something legitimately that somebody did that they could be brought a, a, a lawsuit against and they sue for damages. And, the, the, you know, my question is always kind of at what point, you know, I know that someone's assessing that there is a fair advantage to it, but I mean, these are also having to pay so much in legal costs that the, you know, plaintiff and the defendant are probably spending so much just to have that case that you're probably not really going to get the amount of money. And they might even go over and above really what a person might have, you know, hurt or injured the, the other party. And it's not like all of it's going to the other party in order to do that. I mean, it is inexorbitant, the amount of money that goes into, um, actually suing somebody over something that is a legitimate type of thing. And I, I do the legitimate example because the, the counter to that is the illegitimate example, literally trying to use litigation to bankrupt people, even when yeah. there's no, no wrongdoing that's there either. Yeah. Um, it's just crazy to me. All right. So next up on the list, what you got? Inflation protected. Yep. So this is, uh, it's kind of an interesting one, I think. Yeah. Because I think a lot of people would not think of a whole life policy as being inflation protected, but it is because as inflation rates rise, interest rates tend to rise. Right. And a lot of the investments, not all of them, but a lot of the investments that insurance companies make are very strongly correlated with the interest rate. So as the inflation rate begins to rise, the interest rate begins to rise and the insurance companies are then earning more, which they are then giving to their policy owners in form of dividends and thus protecting you from inflation. Uh, Nelson Nash actually, in one of his very common uh, seminars that he gave, at the end of it, showed what the policy had done over time and how much it had grown and expanded. And he pointed out how much it had beaten inflation, how it had kept up with it, no problem, even though that's one of the most common things levied against whole life insurance is that it doesn't keep up with inflation. It does. Right. So... Well, and I think there's a, a point we'll get to later that I think we'll come back to, but it's the uh, the argument of buy term and invest the difference, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, very much kind of the in that vein of why that would be the case. All right, so what do we got that's up next? Well, uh, a very useful one for business owners, and that is control. Mm. Uh, and when we start comparing it to other investments, this control aspect is really going to come into play because with a lot of investments, you secede control. That's the whole point. Mm -hmm. You're giving someone yeah. else control of your money. That's right. Uh, whereas one of the goals of doing IBC is taking control of banking, which means you need control. And uh, that's if you had this perfect investment that you're creating out of nothing, why wouldn't you want to have complete control over what happens within it? That's right. Uh, a, a whole life insurance contract is a unilateral contract, which in my mind, I think of it as a if then statement. If the policy owner does the things that are in the contract, then the insurance company must do the things that are in the contract. It doesn't go the other way around. That's right. All right. So yeah, and control is super important no matter kind of where you're at in life. And I think it also is kind of one of those things that we've been seceding control 
uh, from ourselves to other people for so long that it feels like we're not, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, where's my, why can't I have X? It's like, well, you gave up responsibility for that. And I think this is a way to recapture, which at the same time, you're getting more control. I think people do need to understand that you're going to gain responsibility, which is also going to help create that discipline. Um, and in a free market, if you're there, I mean, a person who makes a bad decision should be punished for that bad decision, not because they're terrible people, but because that's what consequences are. That's, that's how that works. And they should, and that's how lessons be. are learned in the market so that they don't exactly. have to get. Yeah, exactly. Uh, all right. So what's next? Transferable. Uh, one of the things is it's very easy to transfer ownership of a whole life policy to someone else. Mm. Um, uh, that's, often very difficult with a lot of other investments. And, uh, and I'm talking about like, while the owner is, while the owner and the insured are both still living. Right. Um, there's a whole nother aspect of that, that I will get into a little bit later about what happens when the insured dies or, or the owner dies. Right. Um, but the ability to say, you know what, uh, maybe, maybe you're getting to the end of your life and you're saying, I want to start giving things to my children and having less on my estate, my, my plate, so you start signing over ownership of policies to people. Uh, that's easy to do. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, which is, is a function of being able to create generational wealth and being able to set up things for your, for your kids and being able to teach them about these things. The more that you're able to kind of do that or maybe even open a policy in their name and you have control of it. And that way, when they're saving for college or they're saving for something else, they want to be able to go buy something or fund something, you can teach them through some of these vehicles on exactly how to do that with you maintaining control up until a point that you feel comfortable uh, handing that control over to that person who's insured on it. And there's a lot of different ways. I mean, you can take life insurance policy, policies out on you know business partners and all kinds of stuff. Yeah. I mean, there's, there's a lot of different ways to go about that. One of, the, one of the very common things that we start with with a business owner, if, if there is a partnership of any sort, you need to have something in place for what happens if one of the partners dies. Right. And life insurance is the best vehicle for dealing with all the financial and legal ramifications of that within our system of what happens in a partnership when one of the partners is no longer available. You have to have contracts in place, agreements in place, and you fund those agreements with a life insurance policy. That's right. That's right. And if you do this, Sorry, getting ahead of myself again. Yeah, if no, you you're do, good, you're if good. you do it with a whole life policy, you can also use it for banking while the person's still alive. So. Exactly. Yep. Right on. No, we're not. We're not getting ahead of ourselves. We know where we're at. We're good. All yeah. right. So what's so we talked about being transferable, having being in control, and being able to control where it goes after that, and transferring it to an appropriate person. So what's what's next? Well, by this point, you've got a lot of different things that you're thinking about in your investment. Right. So the natural worry is, how complicated is it going to be? Right. So the, the next th thing on the list is we want it to be very easy to manage. <clears throat> you don't want to have to jump through a lot of hoops or uh, have the average person not be able to understand how it works or how to use it. You want it to be very simple and easy. That's right. I think one of the other things as far as being able to being easy to manage is when we're talking about the, the liquidity of it, being able to, to pull money out or borrow against your policy. And there's some other features that I think maybe we can get into about that, but you, you're not going to the bank, you're not submitting a credit statement every single time. At the end of the day, you're the one that gets to make the decision. And again, with your if then statement, um, as far as control goes, you know, you can simply put in put in your policy. And so long as you are doing it within the amount that you're allotted, that money's coming to you within a specified amount of time, whether that be a few days for an automatic bank transfer, or, you know, a week for a check that's in the mail or something like that, uh, to yep. pull that in. So I mean, that 100%, I mean, being that easy to get that liquidity out of it, but then also having, you know, and the companies do a really good job of keeping you informed throughout the entire thing with a great dashboard of to see what's all covered. I mean, and what I've found so far too, is, I mean, the companies themselves, even if you're fine that it might be a little too much for you, I mean, being able just to go talk to someone like yourself or even somebody at the company is really simple. And they're, they are, have been very helpful um, at most of the, the mutual companies that I've found. So. Yeah. I mean, talking about the ease of getting your money out. I mean, I, I actually have policies with two different companies. The second company is, I would say a life insurance, a mutual life insurance company second and a uh, investment company first. So right. their, their sheet is a little more complicated, but the, the main company that I have several policies with, um, getting your money is literally a one page sheet that mm -hmm. has, I think four or five pieces of information on it. Basically yep. you, you put your, your name, <laughs> You put the policy number, how much you want, and the date. And then you basically tell them how you want them to send it to you. And that's it. Yep. 
you yep. sign it and you send it in and there's yep. no questions or anything. They, they yep. basically are just asking, okay, how much do you want? Where do you want it? That's right. So easy. All right. Yeah, that's awesome. That, same thing for me. I, we probably use the same person. So same company. Uh, <laughs> all right. So what's next? Uh, well, you don't want any hidden fees or penalties. Uh, you don't want to have, especially ongoing ones. Uh, I think they, they may talk about uh, the beginning as well, but if, if possible, you would love to have all the costs to be known, predictable, and upfront, right? Yep. So I would, I would argue that if I could pay either a one-time fee at the beginning or an ongoing fee, I would rather do the one-time fee and mm -hmm. then leave the ongoing completely clear so that my growth is uninhibited. So you don't want any fees or penalties or anything like that for either the growth or for accessing it, right? Right. If you, if you pull the money out to use it for something, you don't want to pay a penalty because of that. Yeah, and this is one of the common criticisms that people have when they talk about buying term and investing the difference or using whole life insurance policy. They're like, well, yeah, these people are, are salespeople, so they're going to be doing it. And they're, you know, they're getting a huge commission and all this stuff up, stuff up front. It's like, yeah, but I would rather have a salesperson that's telling me specifically what they're going to be giving from me. And if I'm trying to change my mindset to being a long-term mindset, I'm certainly okay with actually paying somebody up front to help me set up something that is actually going to accomplish the goals that I'm setting out to accomplish. I'd probably pay more. Um, if, if the person is doing the right thing for me, I'd probably pay more if I knew uh, more about actually doing some of that or, or finding a way that I could provide more value to them, like having a podcast with you or being able to, to reach out to, you know, the guy that I originally went through. Um, or, I mean, he is my, uh, he is the, gentleman that sold me the policy and the one that I will continue to go back to just because of how good he is. He is a certified IBC practitioner. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and he does a phenomenal job and I, he brings out courses. And one of my favorite things to do is buy any course that he does because he, he is that good. He's been around that long. And so if there's anything else that I can do to make sure his business keeps moving forward, I, I'm listening to his podcast. I'm reading, I'm reading his daily emails. I and mean, then that's a, that's another set of value rather than me giving him money for that type of thing. And that's what I think is very different about this concept and this mindset um, that IBC, I think, fosters with people that really start to grasp it. Yeah. And a beautiful thing about what you're talking about, of you trying to support him and his work with IBC, the more people who do it, the more it benefits all of us. Right. Um, so, you know, you encouraging him and supporting him by getting more people exposed to his ideas is indirectly going to benefit you by uh, benefiting the country. Right. Well, to get political real quick, and I certainly don't mind doing that. Um, for me, you know, this is one of the things that I have within my direct control to mm -hmm. secede from the system, to secede from the banking system specifically. But then when you get around these types of people, you start understanding why they're doing it, very similar to why I'm being able to do it. And you're actually able to create more communities around this type of idea that when the whole system fails around us, there will still be organizations and companies that are still going to be there. And with people that have this mindset, I think these are people who are better prepared <laughs> to weather the financial storms that are coming. And these are the people that I'd rather be connected with and be around to have those opportunities to grow and, and to, I don't want to necessarily say you have a savior complex, but certainly try to help as many people as possible get on the right path. Yeah. So, all right. So we got a couple more here. So what's, uh, what are the last couple things we got? The last couple are, we want it to be reputable, which illegal. We don't, we don't want yeah. to be running into legal issues or having to hide it. Right. Which actually ties into the second one, which is private. Yeah. Uh, it's in an ideal investment. Who needs to know about it, but you, right? right? No, no tax statements, no public, uh, publications about who has what or how it's doing or anything like that. We want it to be just you, just the company, very private uh, asset. That's right. I wholeheartedly agree with that. I mean, if the, if the government's going to want to know about it, they're probably going to want a little bit more control over what it is that you're doing or whatever, which again, I go back to the idea of, you know, TSP or 401ks. If, if they're saying that it's a benefit for you, sometimes I have a real hard time believing that they're actually doing it for your specific benefit. Uh, mm -hmm. It might, it might be to, you know, I, I just look at how many companies are, have government contracts that are in the, the S and P 500 and some of the bigger index funds that are out there. I mean, and how many, I mean, at, at what point is it 30% of a government contract makes it a government company now that when they're bailing out these companies are also getting, uh, um, 
they're basically buying the debt. So they're actually the U.S. government's now becoming a debtor. Plus, it also has a huge chunk of um, contracts with some of the largest companies that are out there. I just I just yeah. find that to be problematic, uh, to say the least. All right. So, I mean, that, that pretty much covers, you know, most of the stuff we talked, you know, all the way through it from, you know, high rate of return, liquidity, you know, talking about no fees, it being reputable, having <clears throat> control, worried about inflation, like all these things that people typically would take for an investment. So what in your mind and from what you've read, from what you've seen, when you compare it to, let's say a 401k style uh, of investing or, or against the st- stock market, you know, why is it that something like this, when we're talking about the perfect investment might make more sense than putting your money in the stock market. I'll come back to that in just a second. There's actually there's actually three things that I like to add to this list. Okay, yeah, go um, for it. If you don't mind. Um, so one of which is the ability to leverage the asset mm. rather than you know uh, a lot of a lot of the stocks and things like that. The only way to access it is to sell it or li- right. liquidate it. Uh, the ability to leverage the asset would be much more convenient and powerful which is one of the things that we are trying to accomplish here. Uh, Number two is no limits on what you can put in. With a lot of the 401ks, the Roth, all that kind of stuff, sure, they've made this thing that's supposed to be for your benefit, but they don't only allow you to put so much into it. Right. Uh, We want, in our perfect investment, we would like something that has no limits. I can put as much as I want into it uh, and no problems arise from that. That's right. And then the last one would be for me, in addition to the transferability that we talked about of being able to give it to people, but passing on that wealth tax-free to the next generation. That's right. Um, and this, can, this, of course, would be the death benefit, right? It is a life right. insurance product. It is yep. about the insurance. So when you die, the death benefit goes to your heirs tax-free. Tax-free. That's right. Um, so those are three things that I like to add to the list. And, uh, well, and, and in talking about like why you choose this over something else, you, know, you, you reminded me of one of the things that I – ran into with my thrift savings plan with the military. So a 401k style military with savings plan. And if you were to, let's say, need to consolidate debt, or let's say that you were wanting to gain a little bit of money, and the only thing you really had was that investment vehicle to, let's say, put money down on a investment property, you're like, you're okay with leveraging a little bit of money against you don't have enough Uh, to get the property without having a bank loan, but you still need something with a down payment. You certainly don't have enough just sitting aside. You know, maybe, maybe the right thing would be to wait. I get that. But you know, let's say you do have uh, enough to put 20, 30, 40% down on this investment uh, through your thrift savings plan, through your 401k, uh, your Roth IRA. And, And certainly there's ways that you can go about doing it, but there's a lot of red tape that goes into doing a investment inside of a Roth IRA. Basically, I would not be able to have my name and some other, basically, I would not be able to put that into an asset um, that I borrowed from that I, inside the actual Roth IRA vehicle itself, if it allows real estate investment, I can't actually be benefiting off the cash flow Mm -hmm. of doing that. Basically, you are kind of a, uh, a, a, just a, in, financial investor into it, not actually reaping the benefits of the cash flow that's coming back, right? Mm. However, that's if it's inside the Roth IRA or the 401k style vehicle, you can just simply borrow that money against it uh, and then pay that back at whatever specified term that you have, but you then could at least get the cash flow from it. So you can either build one inside of the po- inside of your investment or you can borrow from that investment to do that. The problem with uh, both of those is one, you're giving up control, like we've kind of talked about, if it's inside the investment, if you're uh, able to actually take it out, you're actually, while you are getting some of the liquidity back from doing that and borrowing from it, you no longer can actually benefit from the returns that you're getting. So you're actually sacrificing some of those returns to take uh, a chance on something that hopefully has a more significant return on mm-hmm. it, which real estate, I would mm-hmm. argue, probably does. It probably would outperform it potentially what it is, right? Yeah. Um, but you're sacrificing something. And the thing that I, it's, it's the thing that really true leverage kind of exactly. And, you know, and then you're also restricted, let's say you could pay that back in, you know, a year. Well, after you pay the full amount back, you still have another six months before you'd be allowed to borrow any of that again. And so when I first came across IBC, you know, we were just trying to, you know, consolidate some debt out of it. So I went ahead and borrowed against one of uh, a thrift savings plan that I had just to just to clear out some stuff, and it really helped. 
and then I paid it back, but I would not be able to touch it again for a long time. And that's what clicked with me when I saw IBC was that I don't have to worry about either one of those. I get full control over what it is. I have as much money as I want to, like you said, to put into the vehicle itself, and I can truly leverage it for something like that. And the other thing is, if I'm a bank or I'm another lender, one of the things that'd be great would be, you know what? I have a lot of money and I can help people get out of debt so I can offer debt consolidation loans. Well, you can also do that with yourself and recapture all that debt that you might be paying somewhere else. And that's yep. primarily for, for us getting out of debt, what we've been using it for the most. You know, it's yeah. within our budget overall. And we've been trying to recapture every year, capture more and more debt into that. And as that transfers over in a consolidation loan, we're gaining all of that interest that we would be paying elsewhere. We're gaining all of that stuff back. It's and accelerating your, your debt snowball is what it's doing. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, the, the, we talk about that all the time. That's where, where most people are coming into this conversation. They have debt, right? And, and right. usually their number one concern is getting rid of that debt. Well, so we talk about the debt teeter-totter, where we're trying to take that outside debt that you don't control and bring it inside so that you do control it. It's still debt but you owe it to yourself, not to someone else. So when you're That's making right. interest payments, all that kind of stuff, you're benefiting from that payment rather than the bank. Right, and I, I think it's important to go, yeah, it is it, It's absolutely debt and you're still borrowing against from future labor that you have, um, potentially that you have. But it's also one of those things that as you are being able to capture it and as, as so long as your death benefit, especially early on, I mean, the likelihood of you being able to pay off that debt in the case of your death and have that money go to your family tax free is probably um, you. They'll still have plenty of money left over uh, after having to clear out some of that debt. But you're on the right path to recapturing all that. So it's almost like it is. Yeah, it is a debt vehicle. Yes, you are still getting digging yourself out of the hole you've dug. But it's effectively ask, you know acting like an investment. Mm -hmm off of your future labor and you are leveraging against your future labor. I know that that's not the ideal way to do it, but certainly I would, I would rather do debt consolidation and pay myself back rather than somebody else. And that's what I think the yeah. vehicle really allows you to do. And the one thing that also really cued it off for me is people talk about how it may not make the, the, the returns that other investments like following the market, it might be eight, nine, nine and a half, 10% return on following the S and P 500. And I get that. But that's also you're looking at recapturing, um, you know, taxes later on, and you're trying to outpace inflation and all this other stuff as well. Well, the thing is, is if I'm if I'm borrowing from myself and I'm getting charged at five for five percent for the company, which is also going back into my policy as well, that's kind of a five percent that I'm making, and and it's not just. I think this is one of the things that really kind of cued it off for me is if I have that basis of income or that amount of cash that I've put into my policy, and let's say that's just for the sake of uh, time, it's $15,000 that I've put in over a certain amount of time, and I need to borrow, you know, uh, you know, 10,000 out of it. The thing is, is like, it's not like the life insurance vehicle that I have, the policy that I have is now only earning um, interest on 5,000 because I took 10,000 out. That's what happens when you borrow from a 401k or whatever type of policy. You're actually taking the money out. You, yes. Yeah. But not, yeah, like you're saying, not with a whole life policy. We're not taking the money out. We're leveraging it. We're taking a loan against the policy, using the, the policy as collateral for a loan. That's right. So your, your policy is still growing as if you had the full 15000 in there. Yeah. I mean, and let's say you were able to put that in and get a 15% return on the money that you're taking out. Well, now you're getting 5% on that 15,000 plus you're getting 10 or what was it? 15% return on the 10,000 that you actually put into place somewhere else. Yeah. So it's, you're still gaining more than what you would have been if you're using some of these other vehicles and it's tax free yeah. and all the other stuff that we've talked about as well. Um, so, and that's, you know, yeah, that, that's the thing that really, I think changed my mind about it when I was looking at it from the financial perspective that we were in at the time. Um, I did want to kind of dive in. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about that real quick? No, I think we, uh, quite frankly, we're running out of time, so we should probably keep moving. <laughs> yeah, fair enough. All right. So um, so we've defined the perfect investment. I think we, we've delved into a couple different topics there, and, and certainly it's uh, it's going to be a fire hose for anybody that's brand new to this. Um, and I just say dip your toe in, it's research, get what you need to know. But let's, let's address buy term and invest the difference real quick. So that's obviously one of the biggest uh, criticisms against, and I mean, 
Dave Ramsey, Suze Orman, I mean, you name it, they, they are by term and best the difference, right? So it's funny to me because one of the things they point out again and again is from an actuary's perspective, so from the people that are putting these policies together and doing the investment analysis and stuff from it, when you actually look at your policy, that's precisely what your policy is doing. Your policy technically is doing a you know, death benefit and a insurance vehicle but it also has other items in it that are doing for other items in it for investment vehicles. So it's almost as if from an actuary's perspective that it is buying term life insurance, but for your whole life. Um, and it is also investing the difference that might be there too. Yeah. And doing it in a cost effective manner rather than actually right. buying term for your whole life. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah. What, what's, what's your, uh, you know, counter to, to those types of arguments that are out there? Oh, uh, I would usually approach it from a few different directions. The, the first of which being, okay, we've all heard the term, sorry, term, buy term and invest <laughs> the difference. But I would bet good money that if you went into a room full of Dave Ramsey and Susie Orman fans and you said, okay, who here has term insurance? You know, everyone raises their hands. Who here priced whole life insurance before they bought the term insurance? And then they bought the term insurance and took the difference between those two and invested it. I right. bet you no one would raise their hands right? Uh, because they hear the rhetoric, but no right. one actually does the thing. Uh, so that, that's kind of step number one is it's, it's not a real argument because they're not actually suggesting or, or no one's actually doing what they're telling you to do. It's just a, it's, it's a statement about the idea that the stock market is better than the whole life policy. They're just saying, buy term insurance, don't buy whole life. And then in a separate voice, they're saying, invest in the stock market. Yeah, and that's another perspective that I was getting at when I was talking about the high time preference versus the low time preference is I feel when some people make those arguments, they feel more because it's on the internet, because that is a cesspool of what it is. Uh, there's some great things that are going on there. But it's also, I mean, people want to, you know, place their moral value of being able to tell somebody and influence somebody because we all want to influence other people. So it's like, well, your whole life insurance policy person is just selling you something. They're just trying to get something out of it. It's like, well, you telling me that and buying and, and investing the difference is also getting you something out of it. It gets you the, the moral superiority of being right, even <laughs> though you're not financially benefiting from it. So I care about somebody who's going to take a vested interest in what it is that I'm talking about. And again, like you just said, they are not doing what they say and trying to convince you to do. Yeah. So then, you know, moving on from that level of it, you get into first term versus whole without the investment component. Um, if you just compare the insurance aspect, term insurance is the most cost effective way to buy death benefit. Yes. If, if death benefit is the only thing you're interested in, you're not interested in any living benefits or anything like that, you just want protection in the case of a death, term insurance is the way to go. Yep. At least for a short term. Yes. Short period, short period of time. I need to start differentiating my words here. <laughs> um, but the longer it goes, the more expensive that term insurance gets. Uh, the reality being that a fraction of a percent of term policies ever pay anything out. Whereas if the policy is kept intact, 100% of whole life policies pay out. So <clears throat> term insurance is very cheap at the beginning. But then after your initial term runs out, you have to renew and it gets more expensive. And then after that term runs out, you have to renew again. It's way more expensive. Eventually, you're stuck in a place with an annually renewing term policy that costs almost as much as the protection it's providing. So if you look at the first 30 years of a person's insurance life, yeah, term insurance is way cheaper for a death benefit purchase. But just looking at it in terms of death benefit, if you look at it over the course of a person's whole life, Whole life is actually cheaper because it maintains a constant level of premium, whereas term insurance skyrockets. Right. So just for buying death protection, if you want death protection for the entirety of your life, whole life is actually cheaper. Yep. And I think that goes, again, goes back to the idea of that low time preference versus high time preference and getting sold, you know, the bill of goods for what can fit in your monthly budget right now versus what, where do you want to be throughout your life? What do you want your overall life you know, to look like from a financial perspective. And the other question is, do you want to secede from the system? I mean, there's, you're not going to be able to do that uh, with that, which kind of brings me to the next kind of point is, you know, 
you could do IBC with other vehicles, but why, why would you uh, do it with other vehicles? Because when we talked about all of the ideal investment uh, aspects of it, we're not even including a lot of the other stuff. And the thing is, is there's no other, at least that what I've found, there's no other vehicle out there that can do quite what this concept does with whole life insurance policy. There's really not. Um, I've looked into it as well. And, and especially when it comes to the liquidity and the control that you have mm -hmm. with your policies, there, there's nothing comparable. Uh, maybe stockpiling cash, but then you run into a bunch of the other attributes that cash doesn't provide. I'm sure if you're holding buckets of cash at home, you have full liquidity and control, but it's not growing for you and it's not That's right. protected and all these different things. That's right. Well, I did want to, there was one thing that you mentioned earlier when we were talking about kind of ideal investments that I wanted to go back to that um, when you talked about inflation controlled and stuff like that, one of the things that people talk about sometimes is, well, I mean, the investment itself, yeah, it, it's doing that. You're getting it adjusted and you're, you're doing well with, and I think it's important to understand that, you know, Nelson Nash did show uh, and can show. And I think if anybody actually did this and actually looked at what actual policies did, they would, they would see just how beneficial it is on the return side of this. But people also forget that because like you just said, that rate is consistent over time. It's not changing that, that amount that you pay per year isn't changing at all. So guess what? As inflation takes over, as, as hyperinflation takes over, you know, you actually don't have to pay more to get the same amount of benefit. You know, technically, yeah. you're still only paying that rate. If you're paying $5,000 a year, guess what? Whether that's, whether that's today or 30 years from now, that's $5,000 per year. Even yeah. if inflation is double, triple, quadruple, whatever it is, that just means your, your life insurance is now more affordable. Yeah. So you're paying in, in inflation adjusted dollars as well. Right. Right. So the benefits increasing to match inflation, but you're also paying with dollars that are decreasing in value because of inflation. So it really washes out. That's right. Um, I was going to say something else, but I forget what it was. <laughs> no worries. <clears throat> All right. Well, I think we've had a pretty good exhaustive conversation about what the perfect investment would be. Plus, you know, getting into quite a bit uh, of the other aspects of, of IBC and specifically whole life insurance policy and how that how those are used, you know, to, to make sure that this concept truly, truly works. I think we've certainly done, there's going to be more topics that we're going to be able to do. I look forward to having you back, but before we get off, where can people find out uh, more about you? I'll be able to link to all the same stuff that you gave me, but you know, there's always a good chance that uh, this is the first time somebody's hearing about you. So uh, yeah. where can people find you? So uh, my website is the IBC story.com. Uh, you can find a whole bunch of free educational information that I put on there. I write articles and occasional videos and put them on there. And then I work with a group out of Kansas uh, that has a lot of expertise and experience and, and customizes our designs to each person's situation, our strategies to match their situation. And they are lifesuccesslegacy.com. Yep. Uh, fantastic guys. And I would highly suggest reaching out to them as well. Gotcha. Right on. Well, Andrew, thanks again so much for coming on, man. I appreciate it. Um, I look forward to many a conversation <laughs> uh, about this because I'm going to keep coming back to this. I think it is one of the key uh, solutions for anybody looking to secede from the system. Thanks for having me, John. I really enjoyed it. All right. Take care. Thanks. You too.